So hello and welcome to today's Scottish Drugs Forum webinar. I'm Kirsten Horsburgh and I'll be chairing today's session, which is looking at workforce challenges for the drug and alcohol sector. We've got some great speakers lined up, so we'll have presentations followed by a Q&A panel. I would really encourage you to put in questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentations. Um, these will be anonymous when they're asked, so we won't be uh, naming the people that have asked the questions. And Austin Smith from SDF will be monitoring them in the background and we'll be able to put them to our panellists towards the end of the session. So we've got a lot of uh, stuff to get through this afternoon, so I'm just going to quickly go over firstly to our first speaker, who is Joshua Bard, who's a data and policy analyst working in population health and analysis at Scottish Government, focusing on drug harm reduction and prevention. So Josh, I'll just invite you to share your presentation and to start. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kirsten. I'm just going to share my screen here. Let me know when you can see this slide. Yeah, good to go, Josh. Yeah, super. Okay. Thanks very much, um, Kirsten, and to SDF for having me. So I'm Joshua Bird, and I'm a statistician at Scottish Government. And I'm advised that time is of the essence today, so I'm just going to jump right into it. So um, I'm talking to you all today about a project that we recently completed on Scotland's alcohol and drugs workforce. So just as a bit of background, um, Scotland obviously has very high rates of drug-related deaths, and so in January 2011, a new national mission was announced to reduce drug-related deaths and harms, and a key plank of that was improving frontline drug services, including those of the third sector. And so off the back of that, um, we in health and social care analysis um, have just completed a large program of work that I project managed around this. And there were several work streams emerging from this project. So um, we published a rapid evidence review and we also did a, a secondary data collection of the skills and qualifications available. And on this, I must tip my hat to colleagues at SDF for providing me some really timely data that was very informative as well that I'll come to later in the chat. We also ran a survey of services in tandem with colleagues at Public Health Scotland using the DAISY system. And finally, we ran a series of reference groups that we um, ran uh, with participants sourced from the surveys. And so I wanna emphasize that this was a really substantial program of work and it really wouldn't have been possible without the help of myriad partner organizations and government colleagues, as well as um, the many people working in frontline services who took the time to um, contribute their insights and their thoughts, many of whom I imagine are probably on this call today, although I can't actually see you. So thank you all very much for that. <clears throat> so um, getting into uh, the main findings, we grouped them under three main themes, um, the first of which was around recruitment. And so um, a major issue emerging um, around the workforce was um, vacancy rates in particular. So um, when we tallied up the uh, employment and vacancy rates, um, we arrived at a, a total of 8.8%, and that's using NES's methodology. And that's um, higher than both the uh, allied health professions as well as medical professions vacancy rates. And those are broken down uh, by organization and category in table four there on the right. So there are various factors uh, underlying the recruitment issues that emerged from this research. And the first of which was that there really aren't any formal routes into drug and alcohol services. And so as part of the project, we audited offerings in formal education settings and in colleges in particular, there are many hundreds of people who are completing courses in relevant areas. And these include nursing and psychology and pharmacology, as well as non-clinical roles like uh, social work, advocacy work and counseling and so on. However, there wasn't a single course that we were able to identify that um, actually focuses on substance use or, or substance misuse or treatment or anything of that sort. On the university side, it is a little bit different. Um, there are consortia that are progressing research in this space at various institutions, as well as a variety of um, taught MSc programs that are directly relevant. However, these um, latter offerings are targeted towards um, preparing people for roles in research or academic roles. And so for those reasons, it's difficult to draw any kind of meaningful conclusions about trends in the pipeline of this potential workforce. Another major theme from the survey response is centered, centered around uh, uncertainty of funding, which is of course consistent across all of health and social care. Um, but in drugs and alcohol services specifically, it manifests itself in the form of posts that are advertised with low salaries or for fixed terms. 
and organizations of all types from NHS to the third sector reported this as a deterrent to recruiting new staff. We also encounter substantial evidence around negative perceptions of this workforce because obviously working in frontline services is challenging, but also because of the stigma associated with working with service users themselves. And evidence also suggested there was an education component to this because the types of vocational qualifications undertaken by non-clinical staff aren't valued in the same way as a, maybe a traditional university degree might be. And then the last point on this is that many respondents highlighted that um, the unique perspectives of people with lived experiences aren't really being fully taken advantage of and that the skills and experience that these people often have is not reflected in the types of roles available to them because they might lack the necessary qualifications or formal work experience. So there are some excellent examples of programs that are supporting people with lived experience to enter gainful employment, including SDS Addiction Worker Training Project, which I'm sure we'll come to later in the session, but these do remain few in number. Now, the second main issue emerging from this program of work was issues with retention. And um, in the survey, we asked about vacancies across specific roles, as well as high level roles, as in the previous slide. And the data showed that um, amongst the lowest vacancy rates in the entire sector were for service managers. And moreover, the qualitative data showed that um, progression to higher levels typically only happened when somebody left their post. And I will admit that I heard the phrase dead man's shoes more than once when we were doing this work. And so that suggests to me a lack of upward mobility within services. Closely related to this issue of progression is with development. So um, the evidence suggested there were few opportunities for drug and, al drug and alcohol workers to undertake continuing professional development and upskilling. So respondents highlighted that um, there was a lack of opportunities, um, especially for non-clinical staff to gain formal qualifications um, through specialized courses. But more so than that, there was also a lack of funding to undertake these courses often as well. Now, another major issue with retention concerns increasing workloads and how that impacts staff well-being. So services reported dealing with an aging population of drug users whose needs are increasingly complex. And so that means that not only are caseloads growing in size, but also in complexity. So the box and whisker chart here up in the top right shows the average number of service users per whole time equivalent employee by organization. And you can see that the, the median caseload varied from, organiza uh, from organization type to organization type, but the highest rates were in health and social care partnerships with um, over 40 service users per whole-time equivalent employee. And I was surprised to see that although third sector had the lowest um, median caseloads, uh, average caseloads, there were several outliers here that topped 50. And so um, the Evidence showed that these increasing caseloads are leading to mental ill health and also physical ill health and attrition and burnout. But I was very surprised to see how many respondents highlighted staff sickness. And so that is shown in this uh, bottom right hand chart here, um, the number of sick days per whole time equivalent employee. And you can see that a variety of organizations reported in excess of 10, 15, even 20 sick days per whole time equivalent employee, not just overall for the six months between May 1st and November 1st, 2021. So when we looked at this a bit closer, um, regression analyses show that there was actually a statistically significant relationship between sick days and average caseload per whole time equivalent. And so this suggests to me that this employee service user interface is a really crucial indicator of staff well-being. The final aspect I wanna highlight is around service design. So. Um, obviously, drug and alcohol services are commissioned at a local level by ADPs, which enables them to respond to local needs, but it also means there's pretty substantial variation in the way that services are designed and what are available. And what this means in practice is that oftentimes services are unable to flow people through systems, but they are continuing to receive new referrals all the while. And so um, they, services becomes increasingly stretched and it has impacts on service provision as well as the recovery of people who are currently in treatment as well. In addition, the funding is always a factor. Um, you probably picked up that's a main um, theme running through all of these areas that we picked up in the research here. Um, Short-term funding means that services have difficulties developing provision and offerings and it also makes um, horizon scanning and planning difficult, not to mention having knock-on effects for the recruitment and retention issues I outlined earlier. 
One important factor that arose from the literature is the evolution of the role that pharmacists play with people who use drugs. So um, the evidence showed that pharmacists have reported engaging in additional training in substance misuse, which has built the skills base of this profession and increased their confidence of working with people who do use drugs. And so there is potential for this to perhaps be replicated across other professional groups like GPs or housing officers or social workers or what have you. However, this is obviously context dependent. So I realize I've just thrown a lot of information at you all here. So I'll try and sum up kind of the main points and I think what are important considerations for future work here. So for me, a big one is improved data capture. And in this respect, NES um, records census data on all of the professions uh, for medical and uh, allied health professions. And so um, uh, Nez colleagues need to keep me right here, but there may be potential to add another tick box specifically for drug and alcohol workers. And so that would be uh, a means of collecting robust trend data on this particular cohort and therefore being able to make workforce decisions on that basis. In addition, I think that the skills pipeline needs to be more effectively used. And so this is in a um, this obviously includes uh, specialized training options, as well as I think in particular offerings in college settings. And so this can be done via kind of tailoring uh, curriculum planning to more closely meet workforce demands. In addition, uh, consideration needs to be given to challenges of excess workloads because this was an issue that rose time and time again throughout the research and it coheres with wider issues in health and social care. However, I think as well, the caseload issue must be considered alongside the job insecurity arising from the funding um, fluctuations, which I highlighted earlier. In addition, there's this pervasive stigma and I think a negative perception associated with working in the sector. And in addition, there's a perception that working in drug and alcohol settings is somehow less valuable or less important compared to other roles in health and social care. And I think that needs to be addressed as well. And furthermore, the lived experience angle. I mean, this research really showed that people with lived experience have the potential to bring an additional quality and an additional skill set to this very challenging work. And so developing more opportunities for them to gain their requisite certifications and move into paid roles is gonna be really crucial. Now, the last thing I wanna say on this is um, we didn't specifically query COVID as a part of this research, but it obviously has huge implications for um, delivery across all of social care and respondents to the survey and the reference groups did raise it. So it is challenging, but it also presents opportunities, for example, in terms of training. So there was some evidence that um, the amount of CPD being delivered has actually increased um, during COVID times. And this may be in part due to the wholesale migration of offerings to online mediums, but um, that ought to be explored further. And I'll say as well that we all know that MAT standards are currently in the process of being embedded. And in addition, the Scottish government recently announced an opioid substitution therapy treatment target. So these factors were a bit outside the scope of this research. And so we didn't focus on them in particular. However, I flagged them here just to emphasize uh, how substantial the implications for them could be on how drug and alcohol services are gonna be delivered in the coming years. Um, I know time is getting on, so I'll just say in closing that this research has really showed me that drug and alcohol uh, employees really play a crucial role in delivering specialized health and social care services. However, the data here also showed that in addition to working in a challenging environment, staff regularly face operational and strategic obstacles. And so my hope is that the evidence and the statistics presented here will help inform you know, governance arrangements and strategic thinking about um, current approaches to recruitment and retention and service design for the drug and alcohol sector, which will hopefully help empower the workforce to more effectively deliver on behalf of service users. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Josh. Thanks very much. That was really informative and really well delivered. And I would encourage anybody to have a look at the reports if you haven't already had a chance to. Um, they were included in the link for, for the webinar, so you can check them out there. Uh, Josh will be staying on for the panel later, so if you have any questions, please put them in the uh, Q&A box just now and we'll get them to him later. So. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm just going to move swiftly on to my colleague Adele Still. Adele's the Workforce Development Programme Manager within SDF. The team offer a wide range of training and workforce development packages supporting specialist alcohol and drug staff and those within the broader health and social care sector. So thank you, Adele, and over to you. Thanks, Kirsten. 
Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I, like Kirsten said, I'm the Workforce Development Programme Manager within SDF and oversee the Workforce Development Training Programme, e-learning team, um, the Learning Centre, and project manage ad additional um, training projects. As many of you know, SDF have been delivering training programmes around workforce de um, development for many years. And in 2015, we took over the programme of workforce development from Strada. All our trainers, training is evidence-based and delivered to high quality. And we've recently been assessed and endorsed by Skills for Health Quality Mark for both our face-to-face -face facilitator led training and our e-learning training offer. Um, next slide, please look. Thanks. Um, so 10 minutes again, times um, of the essence here. So 10 minutes to talk to you. I'm going to just share with you around um, the current workforce development program of training, the wider training on offer, some of our findings from our training delivery and some of the challenges for us to consider and look at the way forward to ensure that we are developing a skilled and informed workforce to meet the national um, priorities. Thanks. We are contracted um, to deliver and fund, well, contracted and funded to by government to deliver 130 training days, which is spread across um, all alcohol and drug partnerships, which equates to four training days per alcohol and drug partnership per year. As part of this programme, we offer seven training courses ranging from drug awareness, stigma, trauma and substance use, and more skill based in introduction to motivational interviewing training. The alcohol and drug partnerships can choose the courses, um, their four training days from these seven um, courses. This co these courses are delivered locally and at a venue of their choosing. With the impact of COVID um, and impact and then the face-to-face -face delivery, we worked really hard, the team worked really hard to ensure that the learning and training opportunities continued. We developed a blended learning approach, which looked at um, utilising the e-learning courses as a prerequisite and developing activities and looking at the timings and stuff to ensure that they fitted on the team's platform and to ensure the interactive element wasn't lost and neither was the quality or learning experience. We also changed how we trade the training was rolled out with more of a focus on a centralised model rather than a locality based. The training um, being offered to all staff across Scotland um, and being able to book through our training website. This saw an increase in staff, uh, an increase in courses being available to staff to book onto, and it showed a really popular model of delivery, if, if we're honest, where demand for the training courses outstripped the, outstripped the delivery. Also, what we saw with a change to the more centralised model was a change or an increase in different professions accessing the training and booking on and attending. These, so we were going wider than the alcohol and drug workforce. So we saw lawyers, um, GPs, consultant teachers, departments of work and pension staff, housing officers, et cetera. So a lot wider, much wider than the, the drug and alcohol sector. So we were reaching between our sort of core offer and our e-learning offer, we're reaching a wide, um, large proportion of the workforce. Our e-learning um, team worked with subject matter experts to design and deliver uh, design and develop our e-learning courses. Currently, we have 13 courses on our e-learning platform with over 34,000 learners, which is fantastic. It's quite amazing, if I'm honest. Um, the delivery of SVQs to the drug and alcohol sector, um, um, that's really, all. We, we deliver SVQs. I'm not really going to talk about that. Chris is going to come up behind me um, and talk about the Learning Centre and the work of the Learning Centre. And that's where the SVQs are delivered. So Chris will pick, pick up on that. And the training and employing trainees through our Addiction Worker Training Programme. This programme supports and trains people with lived experience to work in, in health and social care um, settings. Um, next slide, um, Luke. We are also contracted by Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health and Social Care Partnership to deliver training um, for community-based staff um, in line with their prevention and education programme. This is a calendar of, of a suite of training that we offer for those living and working within Glasgow City. We also have the Sexual Health, Bloodborne Virus and Vulnerable Young People training, which again are funded, funded by government to deliver 100 days in total, again across Scotland. We have the Naloxone training programme um, available and the harm reduction training, which also includes wound care and the assessment of injecting risk um, training um, on offer. There is probably more training that we do that I've probably 
forgot to mention. But as you can see, we, we delivered quite a large amount of training um, to try and capture um, the workforce development needs. Next slide, please, look. Okay, so some of the, the issues are what we've been finding from our delivery. Staffing levels have definitely been impacted by COVID. And again, that was through um, increase in service um, demand. And what we see when more um, demand is put on service delivery, the training and development are usually the first things to be pulled. Anecdotal reports have provided us with examples of experienced staff leaving or being seconded to implement small tests to change directly or directly to work with COVID at that particular time. And that caused knowledge gaps within um, current service provision. We also can see that the skills and knowledge levels vary greatly across specialist and non-specialist sector, with um, deficiencies potentially being um, what Josh was alluding to earlier, with a lack of opportunities to um, training opportunities for those who have been in the sector for a long time. For those newly coming into the sector, there's no clear pathway for managers or staff to work uh, from or to identify clear training needs. We offer a, a wide range of training. However, this relies on the alcohol and drug partnerships or staff signing up to courses of their choosing. So it offers no consistent approach um, to training or learning and development. Josh mentioned um, sort of staff burnout and sort of the retention of staff. Burnout can negatively impact on staff retention, levels of staff absence, service quality, and that in itself can result in stigma and discriminatory practices towards people who use the services. And we know that stigma has the potential to damage relationships and prevent people from accessing services and treatment. So it's therefore essential that we um, take this, take attitudes and values into consideration and appro address, appropriately address that. There's also no standard competency framework for Scotland, Josh had mentioned around um, the difficulty trying to access college courses, um, in particular around drug and alcohol. Ideally, we should have a competency framework equivalent to DANOS um, that's applied um, in England. So again, something for us, for us to think about. Next slide, look. I'm not going to read through um, all the quotes, but all the courses are evaluated. And part of that evaluation process is we ask learners and participants if they are going to change their practice. And some of the what we do is we will review the evaluations and we'll listen to our, our learners and look at how we can further develop and move forward for that. Next slide. Um, from our core delivery, we can see that training opportunities should be offered much wider than just the drug and alcohol workforce. We need to focus and invest in workforce development if we're serious about improving the skill set um, and knowledge of the staff providing the services. By offering a pathway of learning from awareness right the way through to more skill-based learning will enable service managers and staff to clearly identify the correct training and skills required for their roles and responsibility. Learning from COVID, we need to offer it in a flexible, um, have flexible um, op opportunities for staff to access the training because we would never beforehand have had a GP come away for sessions um, or lawyers if it wasn't through or from COVID and changing onto the Teams platform. So we need to learn from that. The other thing we need to learn is that one of the things that's been picked up and highlighted from staff attending the training is that they enjoyed learning from across Scotland. So having the training and available at a local level, but also having the opportunities to share that learning Scotland wide. It's also really, really important and really crucial and something that the team are really passionate about is about people allowing people the time to actually reflect on what they've learned and they are supported to put that learning into practice. So that's something that we're looking at as a team to look at how we can support that. We also are um, other things for us to consider around is the management and supervision leadership courses to ensure that staff are appropriately supported in their, their work and they can continue to offer high quality support to the people who are using the services. Working in partnership to help recruit into the work uh, into the sector, targeting the medical, nursing, and social care students into uh, working within the field by offering a program of learning and development across the specialist and broader health and social care workforce. By doing that, we can help 
build a more integrated, informed and skilled workforce that looks to attract and retain staff within the sector. And the standardised qualifications, supporting and working with partners in the development of a competency framework, occupational standards that underpin workforce development and ensure learning is being embedded, would provide recognition to the workforce, workforce but also ensure that they are being valued um, and feel valued as part of that workforce. And I suppose that's what my, my thinking and hopefully um, we can come together and have further future discussions, even in the panel, around how serious we are about developing and investing in our, in our, in our workforce. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adele. And thanks for that overview. That was really good. And again, to people listening, um, there will be an opportunity to ask any questions that you want on some of that work that's taken place. Sure workforce development team at Scottish Drugs Board and will be on the panel. So I'm just going to move on now to my other colleague, Chris, Chris Messenger, who leads on the development and delivery of work-based qualifications through the SDF Learning Centre, which was launched in the spring last year. Chris previously managed the Addiction Worker Training Programme. So Chris, over to you, please, for 10 minutes. Everybody's doing well with the time in. Thank you. No pressure. Thanks, Kirsten. Okay, so just hi to everyone joining us today. Um, I'm Chris and I work with the SDF Learning Centre and for my input to the webinar today, um, I'm going to cover work-based qualifications with Scottish Drugs Forum and also what we found in our first year of delivery as an SQA centre in relation to existing qualification pathways. So can I have um, my first slide please Luke? Thank you. So firstly, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover our current delivery work and then I'm going to move on to talk about our approval for new qualifications and I'll also outline how we've adapted our own SVQ delivery in response to what we understand the immediate needs of the sector to be. I'll also be sharing what the workforce is telling us with regards to the gaps that exist and um, also where the direction of this work could potentially go. Can I have the next slide please Luke. So the Learning Centre was launched last year to meet the qualification needs of the drug and alcohol workforce. And at the moment, that's primarily through SVQs in social services and healthcare at levels two and three. Now, the SVQ is the industry standard qualification and along with the HNC in social care, it's the entry level route into the field for non-clinical roles. It's the only qualification outside of specialist degrees that actually meets registration requirements um, for the SSSC as the regulatory body for the health and social care field. And as a learning centre ourselves, we currently have 43 people registered on our SVQ programmes in SDF since we launched last year. The next slide, please. So half of our SVQ candidates currently, um, they're participants on the SDS Addiction Worker Training Project. And the reason I mention this is because AWTP is cited in the research that Josh shared as a good practice example of a supported employment program that trains people with lived experience to work in social care. And AWTP was set up in response to something that clearly we're seeing again, but on a much larger scale, and that's the challenges faced in the recruitment and the retention of staff. And it was really pushed forward by a small group of partners who recognised the value of lived experience in service delivery, and they wanted to create meaningful opportunities for people facing employment barriers. And since 2004, there's been over 300 people recruited to take part in AWTP, and that includes paid work experience, that's the unique part of AWTP is that it is salaried. Um, it includes specialist training and also vocational learning through SVQ study. And the 85% of graduates who move into employment in health and social care from AWTP, they arrive there with that industry standard qualification. Have the next slide, please. So that industry standard, that's a key part of our current delivery in the SDF Learning Centre. And we want to move towards offering more work-based qualifications that reflect the roles that are available in the sector and the qualification needs of staff. And prior to the research, we also identify that need for a specialist customised award to enhance what's currently available. And that's because there aren't distinct qualifications that exist for the sector that meet registration requirements outside of that health and social care umbrella. And the next slide. So we're in the early stages of our work as an SQA centre, but by this time next year, 
we'll be offering the SVQ awards that we currently deliver, along with more vocational qualifications aligned with non-clinical roles. And these will sit alongside a program of professional development awards. Now, PDAs are usually offered for people who are working in a vocational field who want to extend or broaden or enhance their skills and knowledge. And just like SVQs, they assess against a defined set of specialist skills. And the selection of awards that we've made here is based on anticipated uptake. Um, so that's from employer feedback, what our employers are telling us that they're interested in, and also opportunities for collaboration with other teams in SDF who can contribute towards their develop development and delivery as well. And next slide, please. So these awards will make up a program of continued professional learning. And as part of this, we'll also offer standalone drug and alcohol SVQ units. Now, these are already available in the SVQ framework, but they're not necessarily selected by people who have already gained their SVQs. This is either because the learning provider they're working with doesn't have approval to deliver or because the learner isn't necessarily aware that they exist. But there's actually 14 drug and alcohol units that are available in the level three SVQ, but there aren't any in the level two at all. Um, and I think it's timely as well because the SVQs are due to be reviewed by the SSSC and SQA. They own the SVQs. And what that means is that there could be an opportunity for us to look at developing new units in areas like harm reduction and understanding and responding to disclosures of trauma. So specialist units really that um, enhance what's currently available. But the unique part of any work-based qualification with SDF will always be a drug and alcohol focus. And that's what we've tried to capture um, in our current SVQ delivery. And we'll replicate that same approach with the other qualifications that we intend to add to the center's delivery. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So at the moment, the SVQ awards, they are the main entry routes into non-clinical roles in the sector, but the research shows they're not actually valued by other professions in the same way as, for example, a traditional degree. Now, Though I'm not surprised by that, I do think it's quite disappointing. Um, I also agree that it does feed into that sense of stigma associated with working in the field. And I think there's work certainly for learning providers to do in shifting that perception. Um, SVQs are valuable, they are hard work, and they demonstrate that you are competent. They also support you as a drug and alcohol professional to gain a depth of knowledge around legislation and standards that are relevant to your role. And they provide you with um, time and space to reflect on your work practice over a sustained period of time. And that's why you build a portfolio of evidence with an assessor to demonstrate your knowledge and your professional practice. What I would say though is, as far as the existing pathway is concerned, is that if that's the only step you take or that you're able to take, it's a bit one size fits all. And although that's not the intention, because the SVQs are applied to the wider health and social care field, their delivery, depending on the setting, um, it can be quite broad. Can I have the next slide, please? So the research suggests that there's a lack of formal specialist qualification routes for non-clinical staff, and that reflects the conversations and the feedback that we've had in our own survey work, which shows an interest in qualifications being aligned to specific job roles. But what we're also hearing is that the focus of any development around qualifications work should be practice-based and again, suitable for SSSC registration. And that's really to ensure it's uptake by employers who often need to prioritize funding qualifications for staff that meet registration criteria. Feedback also highlights gaps for managers and for senior staff as well, simply in what's available outside of the care leadership and manage, management qualification. There's nothing in, in the middle of the, um, the social care SVQ and that qualification I've mentioned there. So a leadership focus is also needed. And employers are also suggesting that the workforce needs qualifications that are more relevant and more accessible to them than the academic courses that are currently available. And there really seems to be that sense of needing something that's grounded in practice and also the realities and the challenges of working in and leading services. Um, all that said, the Strata programme with Glasgow University often comes up as being a big loss to the sector and the courses they offered we're at postgraduate level, so that's an area of work for us to perhaps look at revisiting. But as Adele said, unlike other sectors that do have one, a framework of competencies and values for distinct roles and clear development pathways doesn't currently exist over and above health and social care NOS. And that's come up frequently as a, as a gap or a need for the sector as well. Now the next slide, please. 
So in the meantime, there's an existing need that we've looked to meet in our VQ delivery and our survey work in the summer of last year gave a snapshot of high proportions of the workforce still needing to achieve that registrable qualification. Um, so needing the SVQ in social services and healthcare, but at the same time, employers are telling us that vocational teaching is perhaps too broad and that drug and alcohol input isn't, isn't enough. And the next slide, please. So what we've done in response to this as a learning center, we've developed the enhanced skills add-on to our SVQ program as a bridge to something more tailored to the field. And through that, employers purchase the qualification, um, but it also includes sessions that meet the knowledge requirements of the VQ, but also a package of sessions that we've developed from our core workforce development program to sit at the same level as the VQ and make clear links to the mandatory units to, to complement the award. And you can see these on the next slide, please. So all elements of the program that you can see here, including the support from our assessment team, they're delivered with the perspective, the practice examples, and the focus on the drug and alcohol workforce that other providers might not necessarily be able to offer. And we're currently piloting this with 19 of our current candidates um, who are currently working in services. But really that's just to meet that most immediate presenting need, which is adapting what currently exists and making it more relevant to our workforce until there's something more. And um, before I finish, um, I just wanted to talk very briefly about funding. Um, so just my final slide, please, Luke. Thank you. Um, and I'm not talking here about funding programs of learning, but funding that supports access to programs of learning. And I guess what we're finding here is that employers and learners aren't necessarily as aware of funding routes as you might think or you might hope. Um, so it's important for learning providers to take a role and to be proactive and communicate when they're available and the value that they have by reducing employer contributions to staff study costs. So I've just included there um, a few links to some funding options, which hopefully are useful for anyone who's, who's joining us today. Um, but yeah, that's all from me now on the work of the centre and work-based qualifications. And yeah, thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. That's a really helpful overview of all of that work. Um, and again, please do input your questions. Chris will be here as part of the panel as well. Um, OK, so moving on now to Elaine Lawler. Elaine was an ADP coordinator for the last 16 years, working across the Falkirk, Stirling and Clackmanninshire local authority areas. She's previously been in health promotion for substance use, health development officer within the education set setting for NHS Forth Valley. And she's currently the substance strategy coordinator for NHS Forth Valley Public Health Directorate. Thank you, Elaine, and over to you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, it's really good to have an opportunity to speak about a subject that's very close to my heart. Um, the commitment to workforce development in Fourth Valley has been absolute for uh, the 16 years that I've been in post, and that is testimony to the importance that we put on it in terms of helping us to, to get to the ultimate goal of reducing substance use harm. So, just a point around uh, picking up what Chris said earlier uh, around um, making it available to people and the marketing in this area is so, so important. Um, and I think that should not go um, really, that's, that's got a lot of importance, you know, to, to let people know what's available to them. So just wanted to pick up on that point. So um, thank you. We can have the next slide, please. So it does seem a very long time ago that we started work with uh, Strada at that point, um, who were the workforce development leads uh, for the, the drug and alcohol action teams in Scotland. Um, so um, we, we, we considered workforce development to be a, a key priority area. So we needed to get something down on paper that would give it the real clout that it needed. So we decided to develop a logic model, which is, I don't know if you can see this here. You won't be able to, I'll show you a picture of that later. It's a, it's a very glossy brochure and it shows our whole plan for Valley logic model. Um, it's got um, the seven outcomes and a million indicators. But actually what we were trying to do at that point was we wanted to, to find um, the sources of hidden harm. We wanted to, to get the whole population um, that worked to be engaged with us because we felt that the population is the workforce and the workforce is the population. So therefore, if there was lots of people who were suffering because of substance use, they would potentially be in the workforce at some point and that we'd be able to access them, send a sign of hope um, and a, of a better outcome for people and, and make them aware of everything that we could do to help them. So 
there were a lot of people involved, PE partners were involved in this because we wanted to get into areas that we'd never really been in before. We wanted to get under things like HR policies because HR policies are really critical if you think of the impact they can have on a person's life. And a very, very uh, senior manager said to me at one point when we were doing this work, it's too late to leave when I'm disciplining a man or dismissing him because he smokes cannabis at work. I wanted to see him earlier. I wanted to offer him support. He was a very good worker. So I think that whole thing around changing policy and, and, and absolutely considering attitudes is, is critical to the workforce. We also need to find people who are interested. If they're currently working in administrative roles, but they've got a really great demeanour and a kind heart, they would be wonderful in the social care sector. There is a famine in the social care sector right now. So we need to seek them out, we need to grow them, and we need to get interest in this sector going again. And, and I think a way to do that is by engaging workforce. By default, you get them in, um, you know, under the radar. They, they're coming in for drug and alcohol training and they start to learn about recovery. They understand the services. They think there may be an interest for them. So it's very much a, a, a you, you can start to generate interest through workforce development. So it actually can be many things to, to people um, to help them deliver on a reduction in substance-related harm. Next slide, please. Our aspiration was to really get this competent and confident workforce at whatever level they were operating at, statutory, third sector, recovery, family support, wherever they were at, they needed the competence and the confidence to be able to ask the questions, frame the questions, and get people to understand um, everything uh, that they, we need them to understand around substance use. For that, we would hope by, that we would get them to have a different attitude and we would reduce stigma by stealth. So actually, you know, we, we, we trained different types of people uh, to, in, our, in our workforce development. I'll touch on that later in one of the slides. Um, we also thought if we've got needs assessment that indicate that we have a prevalence of X and um, engagement level of Y, how are we going to find the other people that are not, you know, don't know about it yet, might not want us, but actually we needed to try. So how would we do that? Their mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, anyone themselves, they may be in the workforce. There's a chance that we could find them by, through our workforce development. So we, we wanted to really try that as another angle to engage people. Um, and we really wanted a workforce that we could retain, that we could be proud of, and that would deliver quality interventions. And actually, we want people to be retained in treatment. And actually, people might be turned off by treat, uh, treatment that's not quality. So, and as I said, reducing stigma is, is something that happens because people know um, and they're aware of their attitude that it might be causing distress to others. Thank you. Well, the next slide, please. So we, we went to look for different people. Um, we went to look for different areas that we could, that we could tackle um, with great support on high. We had very good strategic buy-in for this. I mean, we wanted to engage elected officials so that we could understand the policy decisions that they take, how that can be, uh, you know, impact uh, negatively for some people. So, you know, a workforce that frame their questions right when they're speaking to people and frame their, their conversations right is, is good because, you know, we need to really make sure that the motivational interviewing skill is enhanced and that it can be additionally enhanced. They can become masters at it because we've certainly trained from the masters in SDF that have supported our staff. Um, harm reduction, absolutely vital, sexual health, these are all things that we, the whole person requires to have enhanced and improved. We, we wanted to look at the whole population, not just, you know, the population that we think have got issues. The older people who may actually not be disadvantaged, but actually they're certainly lonely and isolated with, with depression and perhaps are drinking too much. So we wanted to focus on that. We also wanted to look at the attitudes of community pharmacies. You know, what is it like to go for your medicine every day? when people are a bit naffed off and they actually treat you, you know, differently. In the main, that doesn't happen, but it happens sometimes. So we needed to do that. And so we tested their attitudes and values. The findings were interesting for all of these things, I would have to say. And also we tested the attitudes and values of customer support and housing. And that was absolutely riveting to read these reports. So 
we, we, we attempted to do different things. Next slide, please. So currently as it stands, we still think that this is an important priority area for us. It's still a part of the delivery plans. I am delighted to see that the Scottish Government are picking this up again. It should never have really lost its importance and cadence because it is vital to recovery in Scotland that we have this workforce underpinning it and actually that we entice people into our sector um, to refresh when people retire and people move on. And Josh mentioned the burnout. We need more people if they're not going to burn out. If the caseloads are so high, we need investment to reduce the caseloads, increase the quality. High caseloads don't equate to quality engagement. So we need to look at that. These findings are vital and critical, what we've found from these reports. I found them very interesting. So we, we, we really need to do things differently. I would have to say that we have been supported in all of this novel practice and, you know, really good innovative work by ICF and the previous strata cohort. The, this consistency there, there's the consistency of support for us for this and, you know, consistency of quality reports on what's happened, evaluation reports and um, bespoke courses being designed. But we have actually invested well over and above the, the course allocation that ADPs get, well over and above. If we were to look and audit that, it's substantial, absolutely substantial. We have also engaged with RCGP a Royal General Practitioner um, to, to be able to um, engage our workforce of general practitioners to increase the competencies in our staff around prescribing and alcohol in primary care. All these things cost, but they're all an excellent investment. So I, I really feel that this requires significant investment. You know, there should, if the need is there to develop the workforce, there should not be a restriction on the amount of courses available to ADPs. It should be as you need what you get, you'll need, you'll get, need, you'll get. It's really important that we invest here. Um, it's fallen behind with the investment curve. It's not been seen as being as important as it is vital if we're going to get Scotland back on track with substance use harm. So it, it's really important in summary that I say that I think what needs to be done here is that we need to consider um, Perhaps um, looking at the last five years, how many have attended? What you know, what have we got here from the, the data that SCF have? Some of it has been harvested for the reports, but you know, we, I think we really need to look at that, um, and we really need to consider uh, that we need to mandate this in ADP delivery plan framework going forward. It's not an optional extra; it's a critical intervention to develop the workforce. So you can tell I'm passionate about it. It's reaped the benefits for us in Fourth Valley. Um, you know, we've been ma managed to train emergency department staff, mental health um, ward staff on the lock zone, you know, and all of these things are really vital. Whereas people go, they need to have people who understand them. To understand them, you need to have the skills and competencies um, required to understand them. So on that note, um, I'll say thank you very much for offering me the time. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Elaine. Some great points there, and I'm sure there'll be lots of reflections on that and some questions for you as well. So thank you very much for your time. And I will just move on now to uh, last but definitely not least, John Campbell, who is the Injecting Equipment Provision Manager for NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So thanks so much for your time, John, and over to you. Hi, thank, thank you, Kirsten. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to deliver this presentation today. Although I won't be delivering with uh, any slides. Uh, so if you like, we're going to do this more as a, as a conversation. So if you like, I'll be telling you uh, a story. And it'll be a story about the development of our harm reduction uh, circuit breaker team. But before I do that, I really need to take you back a year and a half or, or so when we introduced the WAND initiative. For those people that know me, you're probably sick of hearing me going on about the WAND initiative. So the WAND initiative was our largest ever coordinated harm reduction drive in Glasgow city centre, a multi-agency, and it was designed to improve our harm reduction response uh, to help deal with the major harms we are seeing, such as injecting related complications, uh, drug related deaths, uh, the outbreak of HIV, HIV and things like the reinfection of uh, through hepatitis C. 
So we did this through the promotion of four key harm reduction interventions, which was a uh, wound care. And by wound care, we're looking to frequently check clients injecting sites, uh, conducting a very comprehensive assessment of uh, injecting risk, providing our clients with naloxone, encouraging clients to carry naloxone at all times, and present frequently for dry blood spot uh, tests. Now, this is an incentivized drive, uh, and the incentive was very desirable. We gave people rapid access to a multi-purpose voucher that they can exchange immediately for, uh, for cash. So this really changed the landscape in, in Glasgow overnight. So for the first time, we had significant numbers of clients presenting at services wanting these interventions done. If I'm honest, because they were wanting the, the incentive that was attached to it more than, more than anything. The initiative started on the 1st of September 2020, and since then we're now touching 2,000 full ones, so that's 8,000 harm reduction interventions that have been done over that time period uh, in Glasgow in Glasgow City. Uh, when we were asked initially to, to help SDF prepare a bid, to roll wand out in other areas uh, across Scotland, then at that time I felt it was really important that there were, were four key steps for any area that's considering introducing wands. And these are certainly the steps that I had to go through or the stages that I had to go through. The first thing and probably the most difficult was to identify gaps. And that was almost to get an admission from services that they weren't providing the harm reduction interventions that they, that they should have been. And once that was done, we had to help fill those gaps. So we had to provide in-depth training to, to the staff teams to allow them to provide these interventions. Then we had to implement WAND. And once that was implemented, we had to monitor. And it's really that monitoring process that highlighted more than a few concerns, uh, certainly for me. Probably around a year ago, there were daily signs that the, something, was, something was going wrong. We looked at the, the quality of the data, particularly the quality of the assessment and injecting risk, and we could see that that was reducing significantly. An example would be, you know, in the months when we started, uh, your clients had a really comprehensive list of drugs that they were either injecting, smoking, taking orally, prescribed, or at street level. Uh, but the longer the intervention went on, the, the less drugs were populated, the less injecting-related harms and complications that were recorded. So, you know, it certainly looked as if uh, the, the quickest way to complete that assessment had been, had been uh, discovered. But we also looked at other things like uh, the recording of blood-borne virus tests, you know, and we had significant numbers of tests that uh, could not be recorded in the system because of uh, human error. Names were spelled wrong, the paper wasn't, uh, wasn't completed, dates of birth were wrong, uh, et cetera. Uh, and there were issues in other harm reduction interventions out with WAND, such as the delivery of our IEP van. There were many nights per month where it just wasn't out. You know, the, the recording within a main needle exchange was, uh, was really poor. So we started to look at what was happening there, and we worked with Turning Point Scotland Senior Management to try and establish uh, the, the cause. And it, it's been mentioned up to this point, there's real issues with staff retention, a lot of experienced staff had moved, staff that we'd initially trained to kickstart the, the initiative had moved on. The staff that were recruited, were recruited into a team that was understaffed. They couldn't get away from training. So many of these staff had came not from other specialist service, you know, had came from the community at large and were expected to provide these, you know, fairly skilled uh, in interventions. So, you know, it's not really, that hard to see why things started to go uh, pear-shaped. And I suggest that things get that concerning that we actually, you know, we had to find a way to give the service a break. And that was to stop them providing these harm reduction interventions. But we also wanted to be a bit solution focused about this as well. So very lucky to be able to uh, develop a temporary a harm reduction circuit breaker team. The circuit breaker team designed to go into that service uh, and start to uh, deliver those harm reduction interventions. So a recruited staff 
uh, who had been working in Glasgow City Centre, uh, who were currently delivering one or more harm reduction response. So we drew from Waverly Care for the specialist specialism in uh, BBV testing. We, we drew staff from City Centre Outreach Team for the specialism, obviously, in providing uh, outreach uh, and another host of other key services. Uh, now, for the first two weeks of that intervention, we trained the harm reduction circuit breaker team along with the team from Turning Point uh, Scotland, uh, and that is proven to be absolutely invaluable. Now, this is what we would class as core training for any person uh, preparing to work uh, within the harm reduction field. So there are 10 training events in total, uh, looking at uh, harm reduction and our current harm reduction response. Drug awareness, focusing on three key drugs, heroin, cocaine, benzodiazepines, injecting equipment provision, safer injecting, naloxone, image and performance enhancing drugs, wound identification, wound first aid, wound care, uh, the WAND initiative, assessment to inject and risk, blood borne virus awareness and blood borne virus uh, testing. That's a really, really comprehensive uh, set of training. It takes two weeks to, to deliver. But I have no idea how you can expect somebody to go in and provide what is essentially uh, very specialist interventions without providing them with uh, uh, the appropriate appropriate training. So we're now four weeks into this intervention. The first two weeks, as I said, we're training. The, the second two weeks uh, were actual uh, intervention delivery. And since we've taken over the, the delivery of those interventions, the mobile van has been out every evening. It's had transactions every evening. Transactions from main needle exchange have increased. The wand initiative and assessment injecting risk uh, has also increased. There is more naloxone going out there. And I think this is just a really good example of partnership working. The approach was in no way punitive. The approach was 100% supportive. It's drawn in the skills that are already there within the workforce to benefit other services. Uh, and I genuinely think this, this is a model that we're going to have to look at going forward. You know, we're going to have to work better together and we're going to have to invest properly in training. However, there is absolutely no point at all in training staff if you don't have the framework in place in order for them to deliver these, these interventions. I've certainly spent nearly two decades training staff on injecting equipment provision you know, and many of them will never hand out a needle in their life, you know, and I find that, I find that very, very frustrating. But anyway, that, that's a bit about the development of our uh, harm reduction uh, circuit breaker team. Thanks, Kirsten. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. Uh, great work happening and a good insight into the, the background to develop all of that. And if folk are sick of hearing for you, I'm sure they're doubly sick of hearing from me. So. <laughs> um, I'd just like to invite everybody back on uh, to turn their cameras back on for the panel, please. Um, we'll be uh, looking at the questions in the background and be collating for us in a minute, um, but also like to um, give a warm welcome to Stuart Henderson, who is the workforce lead at Scottish Government's Drugs Policy Division, who's joined us for the panel. Um, just wondered if I could pass over to you first, Stuart, just for um, any of your thoughts on the presentation so far, and also just a bit about your work. And also just a bit about Thank you. Hi, so I just want to thank everybody for their contributions. So a lot of good, interesting points raised, and clearly there's a lot of people with a lot of important contributions. So I'd be keen to follow up some of them, those discussions to inform your future work. I think it seems to be a lot of the same issues and themes that's been raised in relation to workforce here. So I suppose our understanding of the challenges are, are pretty clear, but it's about the next stage is about to work a plan for how we address these. So in my role, I'm uh, as Kirsten just said, I'm the team lead for uh, workforce and Scottish government. So that'll be uh, my team that's going to be taking forward uh, how we address some of these challenges to set out. So just to, to go back to the first piece of research that we commissioned there that Josh Bird had uh, discussed in the first part of the day. So like Josh had set out, we, we recognise every member of staff employed in the drug and alcohol services is crucial to delivery of the national mission and the reports that he produced and his team had produced tells a lot about the, the roles and the skills that make up the sector and the ways in which we need support them and allow them to thrive. So we'll be considering, we are considering the, the 
the findings just now. And I know there's, there's already work underway in terms of the MAC standards, which is around recruit, additional recruitment at 100 new posts to local services. So again, we'll be reviewing any of the learning for that recruitment and just understanding how that could inform your next steps in, in terms of improving recruitment because that was one of the key issues uh, arising or key challenges arising from the, the research that, that Josh and his team had produced. The second key challenge it produced was around about retention, uh, a key challenge here around about keeping the staff that's already in, in post. And so I just I think it comes across it like it's clear that the, the, a lot of the people will working in these services feel undervalued or uh, and when they should when they're out they are out there saving and improving lives like what people across the, the wider health setting but it doesn't seem like att- attract the same value or status in a job. So again we need to consider how we can make working in the sector more a more attractive proposition and that'll be a key part of our work going forward as well. In terms of the final point was around Josh's team had uh, looked at uh, identified a final challenge around about service design and the impact on well-being uh, and how we, when you look at how we can improve this, any improvements to service to delivery can reduce those pressure in terms of caseloads. I think a few people have mentioned caseloads and about how caseloads are growing larger and, and more challenging. So I don't know, there's work ongoing just now with Social Work Scotland to understand their caseloads and a bit of green standard maximums and caseloads. So if uh, we can utilise a similar approach in drug and alcohol services in that's something that we're going to, going to look at. So just in terms of my work, you know, workforce plan is obviously going to play a crucial role in delivering the, the national mission. So our workforce teams look to evidence how the evidence provided here can inform future policy development. So we're going to be establishing a, an expert group uh, that will develop a, a workforce plan. The minister's already detailed to parliament that she'll be producing this plan, uh, the Minister for Drugs in, in autumn. So, this plan is going to detail how the challenges outlined may be overcome, how we'll tackle workforce shortages, strengthen service planning, and support new ways of working. Uh, I'd also I've seen in the question and answers that Haley had asked a question around the lived experience, and I don't know if it's directed to myself or to Josh, but I just think, just to reiterate, that people with lived experience, lived experience are a vulnerable part of the drug and alcohol workforce, and that, that there's funding available. It's for the Scottish Government over the course of the Parliament, £500,000 a year, uh, already been allocated to ADPs to deliver lived and living experience panels. But I can sure the lived experience voices are able to shape on going policies key to all our future work. And just as Hayley had asked, the Scottish Government lead on the National Collaborative. She's fully cited on the workforce research and the issues raised around about lived experience, and she'll continue to, we'll continue to engage with her around about the National Collaborative in any way that she can feed into her work on workforce as well. So I just wanted to add Brilliant. that. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. That's great. I, Austin, did you have a chance to look yeah. at the questions and give us some feedback? I think so. And, and some of those questions have been a- answered, and you know, there's been some focus, at least in subsequent. Uh, presentations, but I think one of one of the questions is what what should be done around workforce development at national level, and then uh, at ADP or local level, and then by services themselves, and where does that responsibility lie, and and then how how's all that coordinated? Um, is there a sense of that actually happening, uh, or um, who who would initiate that? Um, I'm not sure who I should be directing that to. <laughs> any any uh, one like to chip in on that? This is quite a broad question. Uh, so for now, just as I say, sorry, what? Sorry, I just as I'd say out there, just the uh, Scottish government, the expert group we're setting up that will contain a range of experts across the fields and. Maybe people involved here today as well, but we're setting that up and then that will develop a clear workforce plan about how that will be, about how improvements can be delivered across an international basis. So that, that work is, is widely recognised, the ministers and everybody's on, recognises importance of workforce planning and delivering against the national mission and how a coordinated effort is needed. And it can't, it's got to be. The problems and the challenges are, are complex and multifaceted as well. So there's no one you can't deal with just one of the challenges in isolation. It needs to be a clearly devised plan, prioritised, and, and 
an integrated approach to do that. Thanks, Stuart. Aline, did you want to come in there? Thinking of this as um, potential poverty reduction uh, vehicle, if you're considering drawing the workforce from those in recovery, that actually has mutual benefit because drawing the workforce from and, and upskilling the workforce, giving access to I mean, the addiction uh, training programme should be funded nationally. It should never be funded at a local level. It should be a national addiction and workers training project. Um, and actually, if you think about that, that's poverty reduction. It's, it's filling the gaps in the workforce of people who really know um, what it's like. So, I mean, that's a massive national shift that would, would actually take us in the right direction. Thanks, Elaine. So, Austin. Yeah, I think this was triggered by uh, uh, John's explanation that, you know, trying to implement one's uh, part of the process means about identifying gaps and, and then people, you know, services themselves having to say, well, you know, we know we've some responsibility in an area, but we're not really delivering. And then the workforce development coming from that. So the question, I suppose, is about whether uh, things like the implementation of the, the MAT standards will, will allow us to do some kind of uh, workforce uh, training needs assessment. I really want to Austin. It's a long time coming. A proper needs assessment, uh, you know, of, of all what you know to to help us understand the the amount of people coming forward. The the you know the whole national um we need the whole national need identified by Public Health Scotland. You know we need to know what the need is, and then we need to say well if the need is a million people and we've only got so many in the workforce that will mean the caseloads will be you know massive so then we'll know where we stand but we don't have that data now and um, but we're starting to get it which is really good um but you've got loads of data around how many people have been trained in SPF over the years and you'll see massive gaps in that so you, you know it's been a, a choice which I think should be removed it should be mandated and people should be able to do and, and you should be able to deliver more um, as a key deliverer of this uh, this skill set enhancement. Thanks, Elaine. John, you talked about um, how you might look at developing this model wider than just the service that you've been working with. Has there been discussions around how you might start to approach that? Yeah, look, I think it's really difficult. See, if we were a business, now we'd be bankrupt. We really would. We have a business that we would identify, you know, staff that were overworked and staff were underskilled, you know, uh, we were unable to deliver the priorities that we should. So funding became available for that business, but that funding became available for the business and we weren't allowed to use that funding to improve our existing teams. We weren't allowed to use that funding to increase a staffing complement. We had to use that funding to think outside the box. We would fold. And that's exactly what we're doing just now. Talking about value in the workforce, every time the drug death figures are out, we're inadvertently told that we need to try harder. We need to do things differently. You know, nobody's pointing the finger and saying it's your fault, but I certainly know for people in services, that's the way they're, they're made to feel. And then they fund these, you know, very short-term type, type projects that are outside the box projects. They're drawing staff from the very services that are struggling to cope in the first place, it just seems an absolutely bizarre model, and I'm sure that's contributing to a lot of the, the ongoing uh, problems with recruitment and retention. Yeah, thanks, John. Austin? And the, there's a few questions, uh, Kirsten, around uh, particular workforces and what's been done, and people looking for an update about one, uh, what's been done about training for GPs and shared care, and, and the other context is in, is people working in prisons. Uh, is there a, a workforce development for those specific work, workforce teams? Thanks, Austin. Adele, did you want to maybe mention about some of the prison work that's been looked at? Thanks. Yeah, but also just to pick up on what Elaine and John had been mentioning there, staff have been attending the training, but staff don't get allowed to actually reflect on the training and embed what they have learned or take that back because staff are burnt out and don't have the time to do that. So again, that's that's something. So staff, there's training available, but the staff aren't supported to embed that. Um, so yeah, the the prison work, we've, we've been carrying out focus groups within the Glasgow prisons to identify sort of training needs for prison staff. 
Um, and hopefully that will inform the training going forward. Um, we've just finished the focus group, so that will be something there. We have carried out nine focus groups. We're just starting to pull together some of the, the findings from that, but from the, the focus groups, we are identifying that staff are wanting to know more about the substances that are being used because, they again, they're being asked to deal with or put in situations where they're having to be very reactive but don't actually know what substances or what to expect from the substances that are coming into the prisons, what the subs the impact of that, and it's more the lasting impact of the substances, so they can re react and respond to what they're finding within the prison setting, but it's that longer lasting impact on the prisoners and also the staff who have witnessed or are witnessing um, the behaviours and they're seeing a change in the behaviours. Thanks Adele. Josh, do you want to come in? Yeah, just on the, the prison point in particular, um, I, I think the, the question was specifically around the kind of offerings um, the special for specialist courses for people involved with provision in prisons. And so it was just to say as part of the secondary data collection exercise, um, we found that the Royal College of General Practitioners in Scotland runs a certificate in the management of problem drug use. And so um, I submitted a data request to them and they um, you know gave me some statistics on the types of uh, sectors that participants were from, and um, prison healthcare um, was a pretty substantial component of that. So um, it's a two-part course, and it's actually proven popular, and it's funded for by Scottish government for a three-year tranche. So um, the funding does exist. I just wanted to flag that up, obviously, in addition to the offerings from SDF as well. Thanks, Josh. Um, Austin, we've probably got time for one more. I know some uh, had some questions around um, what are we doing as a workforce looking at cocaine-related issues, but is there anything else that that sort of links to or any other questions that you wanted to get in from the Q&A? Well, uh, uh, it's hopefully not cocaine-related, but the, the other uh, issue was about gaps uh, in difficulty in recruiting and retaining people in senior management as well. So this isn't just about... Uh, fr frontline staff, or sorry, I don't mean just in a dismissive way, but it's not about frontline staff necessarily um, or, or new uh, groups. It's it's actually just in, in the infrastructure of the management teams. Uh, there's, there's difficulty. So there's plans for doing workforce development across the, the work, workforce and, and across teams, including management. So maybe the folks that are working in local areas might have some thoughts on that or anything that you wanted to add around the cocaine element. Josh? Um, not on the cocaine element, it was just about um, the, uh, the the leadership post point. Um, is, it, is it okay if I speak to that? <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so it was just to say that um, in the in the course of the research that we conducted, as I alluded to, the vacancy rates for people for, for uh, service manager posts was actually quite low. But um, I think that um, that kind of underscores one of the limitations of a survey instrument like this, in the sense that it's a it's a single point in time snapshot. And um, in addition, why um, data collection is so important, you know, if you're able to establish um, a baseline for what you have, and then and you know, iteratively collect information in, at subsequent time points, you can actually start to draw conclusions about um, what the trends uh, for certain posts are. And so um, it was just to say that I think that really, the, the point about um, senior posts um, really, I think, just underscores the importance of robust data collection measures in, in terms of workforce planning and such going forward. Thanks, Josh. Chris, is there anything that you wanted to add on that quickly and then quickly, Elaine, and then we'll just have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Sure. Well, I guess just um, qualifications work, Kirsten, broadly speaking, at the moment, I think in many respects, it's an open playing field. Um, I think, however, it will be a real challenge for us to do something without resourcing and without a lead. Um, and also, crucially, something that both Adele and I mentioned without a framework that integrates training and qualifications, which includes leadership as well. Um, so we're talking about different roles within the sector um, and also without that cross-sector collaboration. Um, and I think in the meantime, just picking up on some of the stuff that I've been sharing, perhaps it's around enhancing what's currently available and promoting additional pathways that do exist until there's something else, but it really needs leadership in, it, in itself is, is where I'm at, I suppose. Thanks, Chris. Helene? I think if you look at the differential between senior management and NHS, and statutory um, settings such as social work and senior management in third sector, there is a massive gap. And that may be a reason why people aren't taking these for the level of responsibility they have 
and as Elston and others have said, John has said eloquently said, around the, the sensational headlines around whose fault is this all these drug deaths, I think that's having an impact on people coming into these jobs. I do think in terms of cocaine, the MAT standards and psychological interventions element of that will, will help us with that. And you'll find across Scotland that it's not equally funded in terms of psychology competencies. So we need to start forgetting that psychology and psychological interventions are only the business of NHS and actually build competency in the wider workforce because they too can be CBT therapists. And, that, and I don't think the pathway is there, properly there for them to look at that. I think that's an area where we need to look at um, that really closely. Thanks, Elaine. And I'm sorry, I'm sure we could have chatted about this stuff for, for a lot longer, but um, inevitably we've run out of time and I'm sorry if we didn't get to everyone's questions today. This session has been recorded and an edited version of it will be published on SDF's YouTube channel as soon as possible. We'll be sending out an evaluation shortly. It'd be really helpful if you could complete that. So finally, just want to thank everyone for attending and a special thanks to today's presenters and panellists. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time. And goodbye.